guys, summer is like almost here. Isn't it kind of crazy that winter was coming, but really it was the warmer weather? Well, let's be real. In the summer, you might want to put on, I don't know, waterproof mascara so that you don't look like the Night King when you come out of the pool. (laughs) Hot mess express right there looking at him. All right. If you're in the mood to try out some new makeup or skincare, you know who to call. It ain't the Ghostbusters. It's me, Minute with Mary. From Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to The North Remembers. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Game of Thrones on HBO, so sit back and relax, because winter's here. Hello, hello, everybody. How's it going? My name's Mary Larson. My name's Blake, and I had a sudden realization the other day. Yeah? A a very sudden realization. Okay. I'm super sad. (laughs) I'm super friggin' sad. Why? More more sad than I care to admit. I know. Why? There's no more Game of Thrones. Like, period. That's it. From from now on, from, from now on. That is the end. No more Game of Thrones on Sundays. Oh. I'm done. And you know what? This is the last episode of The North Remembers that we're going to be doing, I think, for the foreseeable future. <sighs> so that makes it doubly sad. Seriously. I mean, you know, I w- am, am I as emotional as I was when we did the final episode of the Leftovers podcast? No. That kind of messed with me for like a couple of weeks. I know. That I had a hard time. I had a hard time letting that one go. That was... <laughs> That was rough. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm still very, I'm very sad about the, how all of this has transpired. It's, it's hard letting go. It's, and uh, I think that's kind of the problem with a lot of people mm. that they're having with the Game of Thrones yeah. and why they think they're so disappointed uh, in the finale or in the final season. Because letting go of the, your favorite thing is never easy. It's, no. it's never fun. Right. And like you listen to this podcast because you love Game of Thrones. I mean, maybe you're just really big fans of Mary and I. I mean, let's be honest. Um, But, you know, you love Game of Thrones and seeing your favorite thing just go away. It sucks. Yeah. It sucks. Right. I mean, who the hell wants to let go of that stuff? Nobody. Nobody, man. (laughs) Yes. No, nobody. (laughs) Um, so we, we've taken some time here, obviously, to do this final episode. I think we're, we are going to tackle uh, The Last Watch, which is the documentary at the end of the season. Yep. But I also think that this episode should focus on season eight as a whole uh, and m- maybe with a highlight of the finale. Okay. What do you think about all that? Do you think that makes sense? Is there anything else that you want to tackle as you know, it relates to Game of Thrones? We're going to see how it goes because I I too have been sad. So here you are being like, this is the end. I don't know if this is the end because you know the documentary, of course, this was really the last thing that we've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're just going to see how this goes. But I too am sad. All right, you ready? I too am sad. You ready to get in the show? <laughs> Isn't that so terrible? It is terrible. It I'm sucks, like, I'm man. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. Uh, but before we get into the show, I want to remind you that you can find us at maryandblake.com, where we have all of our podcasts, including the upcoming Hamilton series that we will have there. Uh, it is for patrons only. So if you want to hear it, you do have to become a patron of Mary and Blake at Outlander Cast. Uh, if you do that, you can hear it. Uh, otherwise, all of our other podcasts are for free and ready for your entertainment and enjoyment, uh, including the aforementioned Leftovers podcast. If you're looking for a brand new show to obsess about mm-hmm. after Game of Thrones has now ended, check out The Leftovers. It's also on HBO. You will not be disappointed. Uh, we also have This Is Us Too, which is dedicated to This Is Us on NBC. Uh, we have you've been Gilmored, which is uh, about the Gilmore Girls. We got we got more podcasts than you can freaking control. All right, we get, we we're we're all over the place. And if you want to find us on social media, you can just check us out on Facebook. That's generally the best place to look at us. Just look up Mary and Blake. And the same thing for Twitter too. We are on Twitter. Generally, it's just me replying on Twitter and not Mary. So, uh, it's, so you're warned in so, case you're like, "What is this sass?" It's not me. So it's Mary and Blake on Twitter, uh, and that is about it. Marvin, anything else before we get into the rest of the show? That's it, man. All right, let's do it. All right, <sighs> so you want to tackle the uh, the documentary first? Sure. Let's 
get it off our chest. <laughs> um, a, a, a fair statement. So where are we with the documentary? What, what are you feeling about it? I, I know you have some strong feelings. Okay. Well, first off, can I please be the guy who's in charge of snow? Oh, my God. <laughs> because that guy took his job so seriously. He loved the snowmaking he business. He loved it. But he was, like, not really joyous. He, he took it very seriously. He's like, I'm going to make this snow perfect. Right. Um, so we got to know a lot about the snow because winter was coming, of course. We got to know a lot about the sandwich shop lady. Um, I didn't, I mean, she seemed nice. I'd like to get a sandwich from her. Well, all right, before we get into the details we, of it, oh. where are you with it? Are you positive? I, I, I I'm feel negative. Like, yeah, we're tracking towards it. Okay. In case you guys haven't picked up on this, I was expecting a lot. You know, we went through the finale and I was like, okay, all right. Um, I have really enjoyed the post episode discussions that yes. like help you see something like when the episode where King's Landing burned down. I loved watching the after show episode, the in depth in the episode to really see how they built King's Landing backwards and how mm. they had to go uh, really take care of of building King's Landing from scratch pretty much because they had to burn it down. I loved that. And I really expected that this documentary was going to help me love this season even more. Mm -hmm. That it was going to show me people who I actually care about. Rather than just Kit Harrington's reaction, which was amazing. Right. But I really didn't spend any time with anyone that I cared about. Um, I felt bad for a lot of people. And I didn't really care about much that they did. I mean, honestly... Why are we spending so much time on and I it's weird because I liked I liked these after episode things and obviously I think it must have been someone different because I'd have been the same team who created those after episodes I would think I would have liked it right but I didn't like this yeah it's hard uh, because you're so invested in the people that you've watched mm -hmm. and I could even think. I could even make an argument that you're invested in Dan and Dave, right? Yeah. Um, you're invested in the Double Ds because they're the showrunners. You've spent a lot of time with them over the years, especially if you're an avid watcher of Game of Thrones. You've watched probably all of those inside the episode things, and you feel like you know them, and yes. you want to see more of them. And in this documentary, they were almost treated as like they were uh, myths, like above it all. Like there was this one scene... It stuck out to me. It was like, oh, Dan and Dave are here. Dan and Dave are here. And like, that was it. That was the only thing you really got a chance yeah, to see Yeah, the makeup people. Them. And they were like, they're coming to see our makeup. Oh, my God. Like, and that was it. Uh, and you spent some time with the last table read, mm -hmm. which I liked, uh, especially seeing the guy who plays Varys be uh, visibly be upset. Pissed. Be visibly upset with his how his character ends. Oh, my gosh. And then the actress who plays Brienne of Tarth, like, just kind of, like, pats his back. Cause she, you could tell she's like, whoa, man. <laughs> whoa. Um, but you're right, Mary. I think they made a choice to spend time with people in production that weren't all that compelling. Yeah. You know, you had that some... I didn't care about, and that's the thing is that this season we were cut short already on characters we cared about. Yeah, I wanted to at least spend time with the people I cared about. I mean, it was nice to see the guy who's been the Stark bannerman. You know, that th guy I enjoyed. That guy they heavily invested in that guy. Correct. Um, but like, I I think the problem is that at the end of the episode we're spending time with Snow Guy who has nothing to do. Well, yeah, and like at least the bannerman guy. When he was around, so was Jon Snow, so was Davos, so was Grey Worm. So you got to see more behind this. Like, we we loved Bannerman Guy. If you've been a huge fan of the show, you've probably seen Bannerman Guy because he really has been a big deal. Sure. Like, this guy has been <laughs> in every season. Yep. He's been a Stark forever. So to have that connection has been important. To see the behind the scenes with him when he gets to talk to Kit Harrington, you know, to have those moments. With a coat and everything. Yeah, yeah. like, that was great. And I think that um, we were not as connected with the other behind the scenes people. And right. for us to be the most connected with that guy is an issue. And spending time with Food Cot Lady. Like, okay. Like, if, if you had a little bit with her. 
If, like, cool. If people that I actually cared about went to Food Cart Lady and I was like, oh, Peter Dinklage likes uh, Cuban panini, um, you know, <laughs> and whoever, like Maisie Williams, she likes to get iced tea, like, you know, and comes up and has a little banter. I assume that these, like, big time actors either didn't have time for this documentary or didn't sign off on it. Like who knows why they were not a bigger part of it, but I was expecting this is the food cart lady. All of the major staff, like do they get their sandwiches delivered to them? Maybe, maybe Maybe they do. But then why the hell am I spending time with this food cart lady? I don't want to see like, was it cool to see the burnt guys eating sandwiches? Yes. Yeah. But like, I, I feel like you spend a little time with that and then you move on. Like yeah. it's an interesting facet of what the show accomplished. Yeah. You know, and it was also great to see the guy who was the stunt coordinator, who they ended up choosing to be the Night King. Mm-hmm. Like that whole transformation and the makeup mm-hmm. and how he was reacting to all the fans in Spain. Even learning how they called Kit Keith Keith uh, in Spain. Cool little fact. Like I would have liked to have seen more, more. of that. Yes. Although the lady who was the set design supervisor, whatever she was, she yeah. was the set coordinator. That lady is my spirit animal. Animal <laughs> Dropping F-bombs like it's her job. Oh my gosh. You I didn't get to see enough lady. of her. I wanted more of that lady. Uh, you know, and... I think you're right. It's hard because, like, you know, remember how they had those those 25 minute like after episode specials where you'd watch it and they'd go through all of the details of like the special effects guys yeah. and how they created all the, the fire. fire and all that other stuff. Perhaps they felt like, or the lady that was the director of this particular documentary felt like you already got all of that, you know, inside baseball stuff. Well, I didn't, honey. With those things, let's tell more human stories, and that's the real question. It's a human story that she's telling with all of these people that are involved with the production of the show, people that we would never otherwise know. Correct. I guess y- y- there's this line of demarcation where you're like, okay, do I care about these people at all? Is this interesting enough to make me care about these people? You know, had it been a multi episode documentary series, had it been fleshed out even more. I would have felt differently about it. But like this was the first this was the first thing that we did the next Sunday following the finale yes. of the Game of Thrones. So we just went off on this like acid trip of a season. Okay? <laughs> Let's all be real. Now that we've had some time to catch our breath, what in the world just happened? Okay? That was crazy. And then you go from that to this kind of weird documentary that's really short, and I remember it ended and I looked at Blake and I went That's it? That was it? Like, had it been four weeks of that and spending different time with different people, and had I spent more time with the people who were these beloved characters, I would have been really happy. I would have been fine spending so much time with Snow Guy or Food Cart Lady or, um, you know, the prosthetics makeup lady who, who missed out on so much time with her child. I would have, like, it was cool to watch, but when it ended, I said, all right, wait, wait, that was it? Yeah, I wanted it to enlighten the finale a little bit more. Yes. I enlighten wanted... the whole last season. Yeah, it, it did. <laughs> I mean, it did on on a basic level, like you know, the the set design and how it was all created, uh, and in how much time. And they're like, "This is literally impossible. We can't do this." Mm-hmm. Again, this is inside baseball stuff where you're like. Wow, that is incredible how they yeah. how they manufactured an entire city. Yes. Uh, like that. I find that interesting. I think perhaps if we got more of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're repeating ourselves here. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know. Basically, it was like a C. It wasn't a failure. Didn't it blow me like, away. Not, a, not at all. Not at all what I was expecting because it was the finale. It was the documentary after the series finale. The series, fin- the finale wasn't um, the most stellar finale ever. Um, so I was really hoping that it was going to fill in the di- the disappointments that people had and it did not work. I think the thing that threw me off was that there was essentially zero involvement with the showrunners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And because of that, it's almost like uh, of course they approved it, right? I mean, of, of course they did. Uh, if they didn't, they, the person wouldn't be on set. They wouldn't be filming. There wouldn't be a documentary. Mm-hmm. But to not have that 
guiding hand almost. Yeah. You know, that, that, uh, I feel like we could spend more time with people that we didn't know and didn't necessarily care about mm-hmm. if we spent more time with the Double Ds. And since they had no involvement w- with it whatsoever, I just felt like we were being told a separate story that just happened to run in conjunction with the f- finale season. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And th- that isn't as compelling to me. It's it's just not. Agreed. So those are our thoughts. I know we didn't go <laughs> you know, huge We're not going to go really in depth because... Mm. I mean, I, I enjoyed we it. We could, but... I mean, but what's the point? What's the point? It just didn't do it for me, guys. Will I watch it again? Probably not. I, I doubt that it will be on my replay. <laughs> like, <laughs> whereas I will probably watch the after episode clips when I do my rewatches of Game of Thrones. Absolutely. Because it deals directly with the people that we know and care about yep. and how specifically how each episode was particularly made, decisions, why yeah. they were made. I've We've been watching Chernobyl, right? Um, and I've really enjoyed that show. So if you get a chance, you watch Chernobyl, there's a podcast with the writer and creator of Chernobyl, the show. His name's Craig Mazin. And it's called the Chernobyl Podcast. It's been published by HBO. You can find it on HBO Go, HBO Now, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, anything you can think of, it's, it's there. And I love listening to it it's only five episodes it has one episode per episode of the actual show not uplifting um but you get a chance to listen to craig mason say this is what we did this is why we did it we made it as close to historically possible as we can get and then we took liberties in other places for dramatic purposes but this is why Mm -hmm. had we gotten something like that i'm i'm all on board yeah Uh, but i don't think that we got that not in the slightest. All right, so so all right, so let's not be negative about the about the the documentary anymore because I feel I feel bad. Somebody put a lot of love and time into it, and they cared about it, uh, and you know they they wanted it to succeed. So I'm sure on some level it did succeed for HBO, and I'm sure a lot of people watched it. Um, but I just oh wanna, yeah, a lot of people probably watched I, it. I, I just want to be negative anymore about it. Um, Sorry, no, that's okay. Um, I want to talk about the finale a little bit. And I also kind of want to talk about the finale in light of the season. So why don't we do this? Okay. Tell me your thoughts on the season as a whole first, and then tell me your emotional journey with the Ooh. finale. Because I know you've had one, uh, as have I. Okay. We've been on a roller coaster. Okay. Break so, it on down. What am I doing first? So let's talk about the. Let's. You know what? Get, let's do. Let's do this. What is your dragon rating for the final season? Hmm. What do you what do you have? Wow. Okay. Um I'll give you mine. Okay, yeah. I'm a four seven on the final season. Okay. Uh it was it was good. Yeah. Not the greatest. Yeah. I would put it below season six, but above season five. Okay. Right? Um and below seasons one, two, three, and four and seven. So like, yeah, I would put it below six. So I would put it probably in the, you know, mid to lowers of the seasons. How about you? I have a question. Yep. What happened in episode four? (laughs) What? No, I'm serious. Battle of Winterfell's three. So one, everybody's happy. Ride a dragon. Wicked nice, wicked fun. Okay, cool. We're cool. Except, oh shoot, I learned that you're my, my aunt. Two, we're having a little awkward time, right? Okay. We're like getting the peeps ready for the Battle of Winterfell. Tell you that you're my aunt. Really awkward. Sansa doesn't like you. Mm-hmm. Cool. Three, Battle of Winterfell. Five, burn down, you know, burn down the city. Yep. Kill everybody. And six, kill Daenerys, Bran is king. What happened in four again? Jamie, ha- Jamie, Jamie left leaves. Bran. Yeah, Jamie leaves. Um, John snubs ghost. Seriously, what the heck happened in four, man? What did everybody do? <laughs> what happened in four? Like, what? See, right? Uh, right? Does, doesn't Varys die in, in, in four? Okay. I think. Right. I would believe that that would be an appropriate part for Varys to die. Oh, no, no. Uh, Varys does not die in four. No? He, he dies in five. Oh, okay. 
Um, he, this is when Varys has the conversation. Okay. With Tyrion, and this Tyrion is, says, yeah. "Please don't." Yeah. And, 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 so all of that stuff. But what else? That's one piece of the puzzle. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, uh, she uh, Daenerys makes uh, Gendry uh, the Lord of. Oh, this is the party for Arya, and yes. Gendry wants. To, okay, all right, all right. So that being said. Um, I would agree with you. I would say a 4.7, which is low on the Mary scale, but relatively high in life in, you know, on a scale of one to five. Sande dies. Really? Yes. At the end. She dies at the end. Okay. I thought she died at the end of the Battle of Winterfell. No. Okay. She is. Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'm giving it a 4.7. You know, I still love Game of Thrones. This season blew me out of the water in regards to the CGI work, in regards to the amount of work that was put into it, the sets. Um, I, I think visually and emotionally, I was blown away. Yep. And for that, I think a 4.7 is is really <laughs> incredibly high. I mean, if any of you... It's, it's high. It is high. I mean, I've literally docked it 0.3 and all of that is... We'll get into it. And, and I, I'm, I'm kind of there with you too, uh, and docking it for certain things. I loved episodes one through three. I loved them. I know a lot of people had problems with Winterfell. Yeah, I didn't have a problem with Winterfell. A lot of people were like, oh... Arya shouldn't have killed the Night King or everybody shouldn't have lived. And I kind of get all that, but I actually enjoyed it. I liked the twist of Arya. I was a little surprised that everyone we loved lived except for Jorah. But aside from that, I was cool. So I was really, I really, really loved one through three. Do you want to do a GBG? You, do, you, do you have a good, bad, great? Or How about you go first and I'll, like, I'll work my brain. All right. So I'm at a, I'm at a, <laughs> I'm at a four seven and I would say that my good, I have a tie uh, for the season, obviously. The first is the score. The score Ooh. for this season was so much better than the score for seasons one and two. Oh my god, we Mary and I <laughs> went back and listened to seasons one and two. The score and I hated it when I saw it. It was almost like they were doing it on a synthesizer with like synth. It was like a college project for composition students. It it felt like that. Like it, the the quality of the music wasn't bad. It was like the writing was good, but I felt like just the the. Um, execution of it just sounded cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, it was not so good. Agreed. But the the score for this season was spectacular. And I am remiss uh, because I didn't mention it in our previous episodes for the finale. Because especially during the finale, the, the one part of the score that stands out to me, it was this beating bass line as they were mm. dr hitting the sticks on the ground as Daenerys is walking up and talking. Okay. Uh, that was visceral. It's not that I haven't heard something like that before, but mm -hmm. it was just, it worked so well with what the visual storytelling was trying to give us. Yeah. Um, it reminded me, I, in, I've said this before about certain things, but it reminded me of the governor's pulse in The Walking Dead mm -hmm. uh, in seasons three and four of The Walking Dead when the show was good. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and Bear McCreary nailed it with that theme. So I really liked that, but the the tie with it is absolutely Jamie knighting Brienne. Um, oh, nice! Took my breath away. That that whole thing it made me cry. It made me very emotional. Mm -hmm. I I couldn't get enough of. I mean, in part and parcel with that too is the entire scene with all of those characters sitting in front of the fire before the battle. So good. That whole fire scene is is tremendous yes. I could watch that over and over again like and, and, <laughs> yes. and it breaks my heart a little bit that Brian Cogman is not getting his spinoff of Game of Thrones in fact that he's moving on to the Lord of the Rings trilogy uh, well I'm sorry he's moving on to the Lord of the Rings show that's being put on by Amazon they, they've it's now be so good. employed him for that show be so, good. so it's going to be interesting how that happens but Jamie knighting Brienne was one of those emotional really memorable moments from season eight that I will never forget. The bad, though, is that I just didn't have enough time to spend with John and Danny. Mm. And, and I, I think the unfortunate problem with season eight is that the entire season, it rested on that conceit. It rested on the conceit that John and Danny loved each other and wanted to be with each other. Mm -hmm. If you didn't buy into that, you didn't buy the season. Agreed. And you didn't buy everything. And we're going to get into this a little, little bit. 
Um, but if you didn't buy it, then there was a problem. And it's not that I didn't believe that they could or could not be together. It's not that I didn't believe that they should or shouldn't be together. It's just that I didn't get a chance to spend enough time. I didn't, I just didn't, like, I didn't see what they were seeing. No. In each other. No. And I wanted to see it. I, I, I desperately wanted to, but I just didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, the great for me, though, is the craft work. The craft work yes. on this show, uh, it's impeccable. Agreed. Impeccable is not even the word. It is astounding. It's befuddling how sensational it is. Mm. You'll never see anything like this again on a television show. I mean, you might. I, I, but not I seriously doubt soon. it. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe Westworld? Maybe? I mean, that is a show that has a massive budget. No, I'm not saying like anytime soon, but maybe in like 10 years. <laughs> maybe. I, you know, the one that is kind of, ironically enough, lining up to be something like this size and someone that is pouring a ton of money into it is Amazon's Lord of the Rings show. That show is going to be massive. I'm so excited. I know, me too. It, it's going to be massive. Uh, and it will be similar, I think, in scope to what Game of Thrones is. It'll be interesting to see what kind of effect it has on the zeitgeist, mm. you know, um, mm-hmm. if if it does become something of that ilk. Because there's a whole community of Lord of the Rings people out there that just adore the books and the movies. They they are thirsty for this kind of show. So I, I'm wondering what it's going to be like. Anyway, yeah. sorry, Marvin, what do you got no. for, for yourself? Okay, so... My good, let's see my good. My good was that I really felt like I got to see everyone I cared about a lot. Mm-hmm. I I agree that I wish I had more time with John and Danny, but I got to see everyone I cared about a lot. And um, for that, I was thankful because it was such a short, short season. They could have snubbed people Mm -hmm. and i really do i mean even look at podrick or theon you know these this what would be smaller characters i mean heck we even got to see yara like we got to see everybody again and i'm thankful for that i'm thankful that i got to say goodbye to everybody everyone got a proper goodbye everyone got their moment i don't know one character that was that was set aside for nothing you know what i mean agreed I think everyone got their moment to just and shine. And for that, I'm thankful. Yes. All right. What about your what about the, about your bad? I mean, the thing that stands out to you where you're like, this should have been better. It should have had. They should have had more time. They should have had ten episodes. I think if they had had ten episodes, they could have fleshed out the John and Daenerys connection. Yes. They could have if they really wanted Bran to be king, which still I don't understand but fine. If they still really wanted that, they would have had a little bit more time to make me feel like he wasn't the evil villain in this show. <laughs> and yeah. um, they would have had time. It reminds me kind of of the finale of lost where like you still sat there and you're like, but why were there polar bears again? Why did the birds keep flying into the windows? Like, like what, what's this about? Um, <laughs> you know, like, Daenerys continually saying, I can't get pregnant, I can't get pregnant, yet she's having sex with John. Like, okay, fine, that went nowhere. Oh, well, girl's got needs. No, I know, but I felt <laughs> like it was lining things up that they were going to have a child, and that child would be like a true Targaryen heir again, you know, born sure. out of incest again. Sure. I don't even know. But I just feel like there's all these things that I assume are going to be, I mean, heck, it's George R. R. Martin. He just watched this show and went, oh. <gasps> Oh, I'm going to answer that question. And I'm going to answer that question. And people are going to love my books because everything they're going to be questioning, I'm going to answer. But I just feel like it didn't have enough time to live up to the previous seven seasons, questions, lore. Um, I just, it just didn't feel like a properly, it felt too short. Okay. It felt like you needed to write your thesis and. It was you, you, got you procrastinated, halfway. right? So yeah. you you crammed it all in the pet in the last yeah. two days. That's my bad. I mean, that's possible. But uh, how about your great? My great, goodness gracious! <laughs> my great was just that this was truly a beautiful show to watch. Yes, it was beautiful. It was rich, um, and it was beautiful because 
people finally started to watch it. Blake and I watched it from the beginning and we were just nerds, lonely nerds who would watch it and talk about the show and nobody watched it because nobody they were cared. like, oh, I'm not going to pay for HBO. I don't want to watch that. Sounds just like Lord of the Rings. Oh, I don't watch like sci-fi stuff. What do you mean someone has dragons? And I don't really do that. That's just weird. Like I was made fun of <laughs> on <laughs> at my work because I wanted to talk about Game of Thrones. And literally my boss was like, nobody's going to want to hear about that. That's too nerdy. Mm. And I love that it has become like this superpower that it has. I love that nerds have taken over the earth <laughs> <laughs> and that um, other people were able to see what we saw and that hopefully these people will be inspired to read the books. So you've had an emotional journey with the finale. Truly. Um, and that emotional journey has taken you up, has taken you down, it has taken you left and right all over the place. Yep. Explain to me what you've felt over the past three weeks now. It's been three weeks yeah, since the we finale. we needed to digest. And again, we, we wanted to take this time to, di- to digest, sit with it, let it, let it simmer, and go where it takes us. So where has the finale taken you? Where are you right now with it? I'm still a little lost. (laughs) And I think I was better off in a place after I'd seen the finale. I think I was on such a high and I was just so excited and I was blown away and I was thankful that the Stark children were all alive and that they all seemed to be living their happy little lives. But I feel so lost for Daenerys' story. And as I've had more time to settle on it, I really do It's tough because we cheered for her for so long. We were all like Tyrion. We were all Tyrion in this show, right? We all were like, wow, we cheered for her. We cheered for her when she killed everybody. And, you know, the Starks have been really good forever. So go team Stark. But, um, you know, I loved I loved so much about this final season. I did. I thought it was beautiful. I loved gearing up to Winterfell. I think I struggled with the fact that Winterfell happened in episode three and then I sat there scratching my head saying wait what what do we do now like now it's just mere mortals you know since Mm. since episode one of season one it's been yes these mere mortal wars go on there's battles go on between the houses and the people but really there's a supernatural force that we can't comprehend that's coming for you all and that was extinguished in episode three and there were no more magical ramifications except for weird Bran. You know, why do you think I came? Um, (laughs) Is that what he says? Why do you think I came all this way? Why do you think I came all this way? I don't know, Bran. Why'd you tell me, bro? (laughs) Stop working into crows, Bran. Um, Do something useful, Bran. (laughs) (laughs) Like it was just, it was just so epically fun to watch. I loved the length of each episode. That was really, I mean, yes, it could have been 10 episodes long, but it was nice to have such long episodes. I'm still, I've, I've gone downhill, guys. I've gone downhill in my happy factor for Game of Thrones. It's very, very bittersweet for me. I was on like this really good high, yes, and now I'm bittersweet. I'm kind of in the same boat with you. After the finale, I was on board with it. Mm-hmm. I liked the guts that it took to do what they did, yeah. and the craft work that it took to do what they did. Yeah. Then I, you know, as we got to the podcast and we were talking about it, I I felt that it was competent, and I've said that now a number of times. After the podcast, uh, and this is why we took a lot of time. I feel like both of us, you and I, got pretty negative for a little bit there Mm -hmm. where we were disappointed and we were let down. Uh, We didn't say a whole ton about it. Um, And (laughs) I've kind of rebounded now. I'm kind of, I've kind of, I'm kind of back onto the competent level. Yeah. And I'm kind of back onto the competent level because I, I think what they set out to do, which is, Give us a give us a satisfying story with Jon Snow, mm-hmm. and tell us what happens to Daenerys, because again, it, it is based off of a Song of Ice and Fire. They even reference that in the show itself. The book about which Sam writes this story is called The Song of Ice and Fire. So, Danny and John, that makes sense to me. Having said that, though, like when we were talking about this podcast, we were saying, "Okay, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do the, like the final like post mortem, mm-hmm. you know, on this thing?" I I didn't want to have it just be 
what the beginning of this podcast was, which was, you know, what did you like, what you didn't like, what was, you know, what's the GBG of the whole thing? I, I, I wanted to actually get to the story. I wanted to get to the feeling mm. of it all. And I, and I didn't know how to do that because I, I had gone through this whole roller coaster of, ex, of emotions with it. And then I was just, I was actually looking for inspiration for our next Hamilton podcast because I'm also having trouble, or I was having trouble with finding my way in on the, on the podcast, how to approach it, you know, how to break it down and, and what's the story that I want to tell yeah. with you about Hamilton. So I was looking for inspiration and I just happened to come across an article uh, I think it was in Variety, I forget where, where J.J. Abrams was, was talking about Episode Nine of Star Wars. And J.J. Abrams is the director and writer of Episode Nine Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And when talking about uh, Episode Nine, he said uh, this. He said, this trilogy is about this young generation, this new generation, having to deal with all of the debt that has come before and it's the sins of the father and it's the wisdom and the accomplishments of those who did great things but it's also those who committed atrocities and the idea that this group is up against the unspeakable evil and are they prepared Mm. are they ready what have they learned from before it's less about grandeur it's less about restoring an old age it's more about preserving a sense of freedom and not being one of the oppressed. And I started thinking about that in terms, it just happened to to think about it in terms of Game of Thrones. And I said, wow, that is really apropos. That that is extremely applicable to what Game of Thrones was trying to do, in my opinion. You know, it started, this whole season, you could see that they were trying to come full circle with where they were in season one, right? You, 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 there were obvious allusions to that. Am I wrong or am I right? Because you're giving me a face like I'm wrong. I just don't understand why the White Walkers do things in those little symbols for the children of the forest. Like I think of episode one and I don't understand what happened. What do you mean? Like... They killed the Night King that easy and then it's all done? I don't understand. Why do they make those symbols? Why do they take Lord Umber's arm and all the arms of his guys and make those little spirals? What does it all mean, man? I think you're getting lost in the minutia a little bit. Like how some people got lost in the minutia of Lost, where you're all like, okay, why is there a polar bear? Like, oh, I, I mean, I guess that, I mean, you can, you, there's a polar bear there because they were doing experiments, you know, from the Dharma Initiative. They, that was the reason why the polar bear was there. Why did the birds fly into the windows? Because Walt had special qualities that he attracted the birds. Why? Again, exactly. see, this is the minutia that I think this you're getting lost in. This is my problem, in. man. I think, I think you just have to accept <laughs> that the White Walkers, and in particular the Night King... Like to make spirals. They, they like had, to make shapes. There, there were these things that were part of their being. And... Maybe they were symbols. They were they were warnings. They were uh, maybe they were just advertisements of "we're coming to get you." Like this, th- there's we we don't you don't mess around with us. I think there is a logical argument to there, but you said something that kind of resonates with me, which is what are we doing in the beginning of the first episode, and how that translates to the final episode. Like mm-hmm. that first episode, the first thing you see are people walking out of the wall and going into the woods. And the last thing that you see are people walking out of the wall and going oh, into the woods. Cool. Right? And this is what I'm getting at. Like the final shot of the series is Jon Snow walking with all the wildlings into the north and we've we've ended where we've began not and quite literally with the first shot of the series yes but we ended with john where he began which is essentially at the wall and even though we've come full circle john has changed john is a better i don't want to say a better man 
but he has a better understanding of himself. Mm -hmm. We understand who he is, how he's changed, and why we as an audience are better and wiser for it. We as an audience have changed with John. Uh, Because John, in the beginning of this series, worries about the construct that his parents set for him. Who is he? Mm -hmm. Is he a Stark? Is he someone else? Is he a bastard? He's worried about where he fits in to his parents' world. But we leave with him, and now he's something else entirely. He's something else of his own making. And it's important that as he's walking out into the mist, the f- one of the first shots we see is him looking back in the door closing. Mm. The door closing on his life. The door closing on that construct that his parents, sets, his parents set for him. And it relates back to the whole thing with J.J. Abrams, saying, yes, this is the world that their parents and the people mm-hmm. that were there before them created. Are they prepared for that? Are they prepared to move on are they prepared to deal with the things are they prepared to create the freedom that they so desperately need and that final shot i think is extraordinarily acceptable Mm -hmm. i think it's a perfect way to end the series and again which is why i kind of have come back around to competent again (laughs) um but I think where I think where you are a hundred percent right, my darling, is what they did with Danny. Um, what they did with Danny was I, I don't want to say inexcusable, um, because I, I think what they did in terms of her turning and blowing up the city and doing everything that they did is a good trajectory for her. Mm-hmm. Like it, that to me makes sense. Would you agree with that? Do, do you think that it's something yeah. that her, cap- her character is capable of doing? Yeah. I mean, and as I've said time and time again, like they've outlined it, they have dropped the hints. They have let us know that this is what she's capable of. And as Tyrion said, like we cheered for her, but she has killed hundreds and hundreds of people before. <laughs> like this is in her blood. She has been very open that she is willing to kill to rule them all. Um, so I see this being a an okay trajectory for her. Would I have loved for her to end up on the throne with John by her side, keeping her sane and their little baby, like playing with Ghost? Yes, but that would have been the Disney ending. And right. this is not Disney. Right. And, you know, we talked about the first shot with John and where he began and where he ended. And they were full circle. We ended up in the same space. But John was changed. He was better for it. All of the experiences that he had led to him becoming something else. It led to him becoming something that he created himself. Whereas Danny, I think Danny's trajectory is confused. Um, And I don't think that's the fault of the Double Ds. Mm -hmm. I think that's more the fault of George Martin. Um, Because I think Germ had this idea that he wanted Danny to become her father. Essentially. Yeah. Germ being George R. R. Martin. Right. He wanted this. Like, they, there's, there's no way the Double D's made this ending all up by themselves. Like, they, they're, I guarantee you, Danny turns in the books. It happens. Now it's just a question of getting there. Um, I, I think they propped her up in both the show and the books to be the hero. To be the person that is going to break the wheel. Mm -hmm. Um, to be the person that we like I was reading comments on YouTube the other day where I was listening to the Misa sound soundtrack like the 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 song at the end of season three where she she's held up by all the people and everything such a beautiful song but Ramin Jawadi is just friggin awesome now but (laughs) what now he is what do you mean it wasn't in season one oh no yeah I know it's true (laughs) good point Um, but in the comments some people were saying, this is how I'm always going to remember Daenerys like this. And you know, I mean, they're YouTube comments. So what the hell are they worth? Right. But it makes sense. I think people really felt betrayed by the fact that she did what she did. 
And they want to remember her as Misa, mm. as the person that was the guiding light of hope, as the person that was being held up by all the Miranese people, whatever it was, wherever she was, uh, or is it Astapor? I forget. But she was being held up by all these people, and they're all calling her Misa, and this was this beautiful moment of who Daenerys was. Yeah. And uh, Sir Barristan and Sir, and Sir Jor are looking on at her saying, I'm really proud of the people that we've become, and this is someone that we can follow. I, I think the real issue with, with Danny and how they treated her again is that they set her up to be the hero. And at the end, they just said, nope, she's not anymore. She's going to be the villain. This is the person that, this is the ultimate villain. And they made her turn because that's what the plot needed her to do. Well, and it was so quick. It's like as soon as the truth was known, then everyone saw her as a bad woman. As soon as the truth was known about Jon Snow and his parentage, then everyone was like, oh, you know, since Daenerys isn't our only option, now I'm starting to see her as a bad person. Like, it wasn't like she had done many bad things before. You know what I mean? She, well, she, she had. did. She did, but we didn't see it through the eyes. And that's why I'm saying it's like, it all happened so quickly. As soon as Sam said, she burned my brother and my dad, and she's your aunt, and she's not cool, man. Right. Then everyone switched. Yeah, and I really think that a real issue with her story is, yes, you have that portion where it's like they kind of switched allegiances. And I can accept all of that because I think that kind of thing happens in people in stressful times. Mm -hmm. Uh, They see other situations and they're like, well, maybe this isn't the right choice. And that's all reasonable to me. Yeah. What is not reasonable to me is how the stakes were set for Daenerys in episode five, when she is on her dragon looking out at the city and she makes the decision to burn the the effort down. She's burning it all down. We don't have any reasoning for it. We don't even have an inciting incident for it. There are no stakes set for us as viewers. She simply does it because the plot needs her to do it now there's an argument that she's alone she's making bad decisions she's depressed all of those things that we said in in the in the previous episodes but the stakes here are muddled at best in my opinion and and by stakes i mean what is what's the whole purpose what's the whole reason for what you're doing what are the like we just watched Chernobyl, right? There was yeah. there were stakes there. Like either you fix this thing and people are okay, or you don't and people die. Those are stakes. Mm-hmm. What am what am I risking, and what happens if I fail? Those are two staple things of stakes. What am I risking, and what happens if I fail? What are the consequences? And we don't really get to know what the consequences are in the finale. We don't know. Okay, right. so all of King's Landing is burnt. Like, nobody lives there. All the homes, everything. It's all burnt to ashes. Cleanup crew on Isle 9, like, needs to do the entire King's Landing. So who ends up living in King's Landing? Now that Daenerys is dead, who's ruling all of the, you know, Slaver's Bay? Like, what the heck's going on there? Right. Um, and then who ends up moving into King's Landing? Like, what the heck? And even and even on... That, that's on a, no, that's okay. That's on a <laughs> macro level. And you're right. Those are all things that are true. I'm even more concerned on a micro level, right? On a micro level, the stakes being, what is the point of what Danny is doing? Like, what, what happens? What is she risking? And what happens if she doesn't, what are the consequences if she fails? Right? Because either way, she's won the war. She's won it. That's it. Mm-hmm. What is she actually risking? She doesn't have any any more human connections. Mm-hmm. Because earlier in the episode, we see her talk to John and say, fine, let it be fear then. She's not risking anything with John. Yes. She doesn't have a conversation with John about, this is going to happen. And this is why. I, I can't risk being in charge of all of these people that hate me. Mm-hmm. I have no love. I'm going to burn them all down. And what happens when she does it? The clear stakes would have been John saying, don't do it. Because if you do it, either one, we're going to have an issue between you and I, like we're going to have to fight it out. Or two, we can, we can never, ever be. We, we are, are, are the way that we want to do but it. But you're saying because he doesn't say that, 
Yeah, because there's there's nothing. There's no. There are no stakes for Danny to 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 make a choice during that time. She just chooses. He says please, but you're saying you wish that John would have fleshed it out. Like Danny, seriously, if you do this, you're gonna be too crazy, and I can't be your boyfriend anymore. Yeah, like on a very basic level, yes. Because even though I don't want to be your boyfriend anymore, because you're my aunt. There, there's nothing personal about it anymore. She goes. It, it reminds me almost of, you know, think like Independence Day or like Armageddon. When you see that big asteroid collide with Paris in Armageddon, mm. you see the whole thing blow up and the and an Eiffel Tower blows up, or even in Arm in, in Independence Day when the aliens blow up the White House, mm-hmm. you're like, whoa! Like that was. That was incredible. Like, I've never seen the Eiffel Tower blow up or the White House blow up. But those aren't stakes. You don't know anybody in the White House. You don't care about anybody in Paris and Armageddon. They're just hundreds of thousands of people that you have no relationship with. And they just blow up for the sake of blowing up. It's just spectacle. And that, I think, is the issue with what they did on Game of Thrones. The stakes are very low in terms of it's obvious that... Danny blowing up the city is bad. Yes. There's nothing emotional about that. It sucks. There's nothing pulling you either way, which again takes us back to to Danny and John. If there's a moment between the two, if there's a human relationship between the two and John sets stakes for Danny or vice versa, what is Danny losing by blowing up that city? Nothing. But if she does, if he sets those stakes, she loses John. She loses her humanity. You could argue that she does lose her, her humanity, especially with the visual aspect of her with the dragon wings behind her. She's finally become the dragon. She's lost all touch with everything. Um, but I, I, I think it's not a coincidence that the show becomes most visceral when she and John are back together again. And he says, did you see the bodies? Did you see the mm-hmm. kids? Look what you did, you little jerk. Yes. You know, Home alone, yes. And she does have this beautiful line of, it's hard to see things that have never been before. I love that line. Yes. It's almost like she's childlike. She doesn't understand the consequences. And when she he says to her, did you see all the stuff? She says, well, yeah, she was, uh, Cersei was using her, her people against me as a weapon. So I had to take them out. What the hell kind of stakes is that? Nobody cares about them. I mean... I cared a little bit about the mom who had the Cersei haircut. Yeah, but even then, you don't have a real relationship with her, no, right? I don't. Uh, I mean, the show is 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 clear on Daenerys' final moment, which is great. The dragon takes her back with her to wherever they're going to go. Somewhere. Uh, and her the the moment that we see Daenerys that at that we know born essentially is the end of season one where she comes out of the fire and with her are her dragons she brings dragons into life and in death the dragons take her away um, which I think is is fair but she's also basing her entire rule within the construct that was set by their parents. Right, so you see John moving out of the construct at the end of the series. Yeah, he's like, "Screw you all! I'm going to go hang up north." Daenerys is saying, "I'm going to break the wheel," but the breaking the wheel, the idea is based on the construct that her parents created. Meaning, she's becoming the ruler because she's a Targaryen, and that is it. That's the one thing that motivates her. It's the thing for the thingness of it all. It's just ruling for the sake. Of ruling, it's being a Targaryen hmm. for the sake of being a Targaryen, which is why I think her demise is proper. Yeah, I think it's proper because that's just the way that it worked. It, but she doesn't have anything between she and John, and I, I go back and forth about this because I think of like something that. It, these two shows, well, th- these two things are, are going to be considered hand in hand, I think, from now on, which are the Avengers and Game of Thrones. Like, the Avengers, Infinity War, half the population, you know, spoiler alert. Um, so in the previous movie. Infinity War, half the population goes to dust because Thanos snaps his fingers and that's that. And on a macro level, that's a big deal. But the stakes are with the characters that we know and love. So when we see... Um, you know, half the people get dusted that we know and love, we're upset about it. Mm -hmm. Or when we see Spider-Man clinging to Iron Man, it's a big deal because we know that relationship. 
And they take it even further in Endgame with spoiler alert. Yes, spoiler alert. You've been warned You've three been times. Warned. Spoiler alert for Endgame. We see Tony with his daughter. The stakes for Tony are so small, yet they are incredible. So they are incredible. I don't want to lose my daughter. He refuses to do what he needs to do because of his daughter. This is a, a child that we've seen for about three and a half minutes. And we love her simply because of one amazing line. Mm -hmm. I love you 3,000. At no point did we get... Well, and she was a kid. You like love kids right away because you're like, oh, you're a kid. It's like what they do with dogs, you know? Had there been a dog in King's yes. Landing, that's what they should have done, guys. They should have had the wild dogs of King's Landing <laughs> running around looking for their masters. So when it comes to the stakes of what Danny and John were doing, there was nothing personal. It was only macro. It was only the, the White House being blown up. It was only the Eiffel Tower being blown up. Why? Because of time? Because they didn't have enough time to flesh it out? Or because... yes. But I still think you could have gotten the correct stakes out of it if you had a proper conversation between the two of them. And like, because I like to work within the construct and the confines of what the show has given us. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to wholesale change it. I don't think that's fair because they clearly had a story they wanted to tell. They wanted to get to certain points and you can't just change the outcome because that's not the story that they're telling. I think the idea is, how do you get to the points that they're telling? And I think the point is nobody cared about what Daenerys did. And because of that, nobody it never resonated with anybody. And once that happened, you couldn't buy into the conceit that Danny had turned and that John needed to kill her because of it. Mm -hmm. There was nothing set forth bet between the two characters. Well, because John doesn't want to be with her. Once he learns that she's his aunt... He doesn't want to be with her, and that's off the table, and that is why she checks out. Yes, but she doesn't make that decision because of John, right? She doesn't... That John's decision has no bearing on whether or not she was going to do what she was going to do. Yeah, because she's alone. Yeah, but it doesn't change anything for John. He already has made his decision that he doesn't want to be with her. Oh, yeah. Right? So whether or not she blows up King's Landing doesn't change the fact that he wants to be with her. He even argues with Tyrion saying, you weren't there. You don't know what was going on. This was hard for her. He defends her. There's and not until we get to the actual conversation with John and Danny do we have any kind of emotional feeling towards what Danny was doing with the city. And that's the issue, I think. Is that we were in her shoes and from her perspective up until season eight. And we saw things from her perspective and we cheered her on. And now we're in the Stark's perspective. We're in Sam's perspective. And we see Danny as a villain. Yeah, because so suddenly her connection to humanity is gone. And when she says, let it be fear then, all of those stakes, all of those personal connections, the humanity of what she is capable of doing is now gone. Well, and I just feel bad because keeping it real, guys. You know when you've gone through a breakup and like it's the heat of the moment, like that day, and you kind of do something a little crazy? Yes. That's why I feel a little bad for Daenerys, okay? Right. And she she just had a dragon. Okay, like normal people, we would have been like, oh, screw that person. And then you like go and you block them on Facebook or you like prank call them a million times. <laughs> you send them a you, bag like, of dicks. Yeah, you send them a bag of dicks. You can look it up at bagofdicks.com. Um, maybe you go and eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's. Maybe you go, um, not like I did it, but uh, maybe you would just go to like a show and like hook up with someone random just to be like, I've still got it. <laughs> um, yeah, that happened. That happened. Oh my God. I didn't do anything bad. I just said hook up, which means like make out, but mm -hmm. I like sloppy made out on mm -hmm. a dance floor. That mm -hmm. was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Danny didn't get that. Danny didn't get to go to a local pub, find Brienne of Tarth, drink out of, you know, Tormund's giant goat horn, a lot of mead, and just get smashed and have Podrick sing her a slong about his dong and 
You know what I mean? She didn't get that. She didn't get the Ben and Jerry's, guys. Mm -hmm. She had a dragon, and she just went a little crazy. She found out her boyfriend didn't want to be with her anymore, and there was nothing she could do to change it. Yeah. And she's all alone, and Cersei sucks, and the Night King sucks, and everything sucks. Okay, guys? And all of us have had those days. We've all had those days. <laughs> you know, I can accept like the whole thing with, with Brienne and Jamie. I can accept that. Like I love how they ended that with Brienne and Jamie. Oh my gosh, most people hate it. I yes. loved it. I thought it was friggin' awesome. I like I just I thought it was so fitting that she writes in the book for him. I just thought that was... Oh, that, yes. Not him leaving and going to... Right. But, see, that's a case where we, where, where we are judging too quickly. Um, we're judging too quickly about the arc that Jamie had. Yes, was it not as befitting in season... In episode five that Jamie dies with Cersei and Cersei has this kind of death where she's just alone... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that that's not wholly satisfying, but seeing Brienne with tears in her eyes writing in the Book of Good Deeds and in, in the Book of Brothers at the end saying how he defended, he died defending his queen, that is fitting to me. I, I, I yes. find that exceptional. Yes. And it, that it's by the hand of Brienne of Tarth who's doing it. Yes. Exceptional. Uh, uh, the thing, talking about the first and last scenes with all of the other characters, the first scenes with Sansa, who wanted to become this woman who she wanted, to be, wanted to be the queen, and here she is, full circle, back in Winterfell, the queen. She's changed. She's better for it. Queen of the North. But she's the queen of the North. Even Arya. Arya was a girl that never fit in. She was a girl that was doing her own thing. She was the one who was making fun of Bran as he was doing the arrow, as doing the bow and arrow, and shooting it better than he ever could. Yes. She never fit into that world. She never fit into being the lady. And what is she doing at the end? She's never fitting in with the world. She's seeing something else. Mm. She's going west of Westeros. The same thing with Jon. He is full circle, but he has changed. He yeah. is better for it. And Daenerys, I feel like, is full circle. She is what she wanted to become. She's changed. She may not be better off, but she is what she is. So, I don't know. I, I feel like they accomplished what they tried to do, which going back to the beginning of this podcast episode, which was what I was saying is they had a definite idea of creating a circle. They had an idea of creating something that reflected season one and showing you that these people were different and still the same at the same time, but they were all better off for it. Um, Do you think they succeeded in that or do you think they failed at that? Mm. That's a great question. And I think that it was neither. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I will say that they end off the show with Bran being king. And that to me is an absolutely unearned. Agreed. Okay. Ending. That's my problem. That's an absolutely that unearned is, ending. That is my biggest problem now that I've had time to sit on it is Bran being king because I honestly sit here saying, Bran, you flipping new. You th- let's be real. This isn't even Bran. Okay, guys? I, I'm not Bran anymore. I'm not Bran anymore. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> the three eyed raven is the king and he knew. He knew he was going to be asked to be king. That's why he came down. He well, knew. we can we can assume that he knew. Let's be real. He flipping knew. This is the kid that like Hodor Hodor. Like <laughs> this is the kid that like talked to his dad as he was walking up to the Tower of Joy to go see Baby John. Like this kid can do magical things, but when it really counts, when it really counts, when he could have easily warged into a dragon and had that dragon eat the Night King, or he could have done something cool. He walked into a bird because he knew, oh, in my dream, I'm king anyway. NBD. No big deal. For those of you who don't know. (laughs) Who aren't hip to the lingo. (laughs) Like, he literally was like, I'm just going to pretend that I'm, like, I'm just going to sit here. But I know I don't have to do jack crap because I know I'm going to end up on the throne someday. So I'm just going to go be a raven and like get the aerial view out of this. I'm going to get the drone view of this epic battle that I know I'm going to live through. Not only am I going to live through it, but I'm going to be king. 
that line, the final line with with Brand saying, "What do you think I've I've been came all this way for?" It's a damning line. It's it's something it needs that, maniacal laughter underneath it. Yeah, like <laughs> you know, like it's. Everyone else, like, I agree. John going up north and, like, truly loving it. John was always pumped about the north. He never saw it as a place for broken things and, and bastards and, you know, thieves and everything. He he was pumped to go up north. Arya's always been different. Sansa always wanted to agree. I agree with so many of these circles. I yes. really, really do. Brandon Stark, the third-eyed raven, not cool. It's It's an unearned ending, and I would accept it it, it's almost as if the Double Ds and even Germ have no idea what to do with Bran. They had no idea what to do with him. Even in the show, the kid was gone for an entire season. And then he came back with puberty. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But they, I, I feel like they had no idea what to do with him. And it's obvious to me that they didn't. Because he didn't do anything. He yep. didn't do anything other than Hodor, Hodor, right? Yep. He didn't affect the past at all. He didn't affect the the present at all. Certainly, he warged out into crows, you know, for, for nothing other than just maybe trying to lure the Night King to where he was. Like, maybe that's something that he did. But it, it isn't clear in the no, show, number not. one. Um, and, I, you know, I think there's one thing, you know, for, you know, spoon feeding things to, to the audience but it's another thing to just be entirely completely vague about it and even if that's what his, the extent of what he did to his abilities was is that really enough is that enough to warrant him being the king now the speech that Tyrion has saying you know stories are what unites us and what better story than brand the broken i agree it's a nice story would it have been better if Brandon Broken actually did something to affect yeah. the plot? Yeah. Thanks, Bran. Thanks for nothing. Right. That's why it's an un... If he had done something, if he had done one thing to affect the plot in any sp- spectacular way... Then I would be like, congratulations, you've won. You've won the Game of Thrones, then Brandon I can see Stark. It. Then I can see it, right worthless but i I, he did he just didn't and that's why it's unearned you know what let's get off the crabby train yes let's get onto the positive train for those of you who don't know me i'm generally an optimistic person yes but as you can tell i've been in a bit of a doldrum henceforth why it's taken us three weeks to do this episode (laughs) sansa stark sansa stark and how she ended is perfect for her it's perfect because she came that she became that person that the way that it ended. Yeah. Like that was a natural thing for her. Her storyline was brilliant. I her storyline was so multifaceted, so much growth. Um love, love, love her storyline. Are you feeling better about Arya? I've always felt fine about Arya. Okay. I've been on the Arya train. I Arya does not Long in this world. Remember I said that she's like Frodo? She's done yes. some weird stuff. Yes. So she needs to go on a little boat somewhere. So does John. John's like Frodo. You got to go somewhere different, man. Got to go up north. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I'll go back to the whole thing with John and Daenerys right before he, he you know, he, he kills her. I th- I, again, I will say it was such a beautifully written scene. It made me weep. It really did. I agree. Um, not to the same level of Jamie knighting Brienne, but I finally got some kind of, cl- not closure, but I, I got some kind of stakes with, with between the mm-hmm. two of them, where it was where John finally realized, this ain't going to work. This is going to be bad. This is, this is it. Yeah. Um, and I loved that naivete that Amelia Clark had where she's smiling and talking about the kid who couldn't count, couldn't count to twenty, and we needed that. We had such bad Daenerys for the past two episodes. Yeah, um, such a, really a, a remarkable scene between the two, uh, and seeing Kit's reaction to it in, in to the, the last table watch, read to the table read was heartbreaking. It was. It really was. Like the poor guy was crying. You could see, you know. You could see him being like, wow, 
I I can't believe that's the case. And like Amelia Clark looking at him like, oh my God, yeah, like this is what's going to happen. Like, and you know, here's the other thing too. Going back to the last watch, they said that it, you know it was John killing Daenerys, and then end of Game of Thrones. That was the end. Is that something that you think they changed? Well, they said that they filmed multiple endings, different endings for Game of Thrones. Yep. So that people wouldn't know and couldn't really spoil it. So, yeah, they said in the documentary, they made it seem like John stabs Daenerys black. Like, done. Yes. There, there's the end of the, se- end of the series. I know it's kind of a useless... It's kind of a useless exercise. But given the fact that we've we've talked about these final shots and the denouement, if you will. Denouement. Uh, um, you know, because the final shot has to encapsulate, in my opinion, everything that your show or your movie has tried to achieve. Um, you think of the leftovers with the goat walking away in the house. Uh, you think of Breaking Bad with Walt looking up at his creation. Uh, whether or not he's alive or dead, we don't know. Spoiler alert. But, you know, you, you, you consider that. Or even the final shot of Lost with people, with the church and Jack looking up at the airplane flying over. You know, those shots encapsulate, whether you believe it or not, what those shows created. Would, in this exercise, John killing Danny encapsulate everything that Game of Thrones achieved for you? Or do you think it ended in a more fitting fashion with John walking up to the, to the north. I liked John going up north. Right. I think, I mean, there's already so many questions that I have, you know, where did, where is Daenerys's body? You know, um, how did King's Landing get rebuilt? You know, there's all these questions that I already have, but at least a bunch of them are answered in this epilogue. Yes. So I'm okay with having an epilogue. I'm okay with not ending on John stabbing Daenerys. I'm really okay with that. I think I would have been like, "What?" But yeah, it, it would. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, like I. Do you feel like that would have been a better ending with John stabbing Daenerys and the and that's the end? No. I think I'm with you. I think I, I think I can co-sign. Now, if the Night King stabbed Daenerys. <laughs> that would have been something. <laughs> that would have been something. I just wish I had more time with the Night King. Not the Night King per se, but like, but like the White the, Walkers. The, like the, 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 the specter of yeah, the White Walkers. I just felt like it was supernatural for so much of the show. And then all of a sudden it's like, never mind. Most of the world will never know about the White Walkers. Yeah, now, now this is th- this is something that we can, I think, as a, a Game of Thrones community, argue about, which is the importance of the of the White Walkers and what they did for the story and the show telling us from day one that this is the real threat, and then all of a sudden, no, you know, the halfway problem- through the final season, they're not anymore. It's okay. You know what this problem is for all of my Harry Potter fans. All you sitting out there being like, you're a wizard, Harry. What are you about to say, Mary? We've got our wands. Okay, we're ready. (laughs) Dumbledore's army. You're all here. This is the Horcrux versus the um, Deathly Deathly Hallows Hallows problem. Yes. Which, let's be real, wasn't even that like easy to follow in the book okay harry had a tough time what do you deal with do you deal with the deathly follow hallows do you deal with the horcruxes and he had a lot of tutelage you know from ghost dumbledore to help him and it was fine they figured it out but in the movie they just had to like fast forward through that man they were like okay there's these deathly hallows and then there are these horcruxes but just take my word for it Focus on the Horcruxes, okay? <laughs> just, just take our word for it, okay? We're not, we keep, we don't have time. We don't have time to tell you the whole story. We don't have time to go into like any of this stuff. Just, just deal with it. Even though, yes, you could have a wand that fixes everything. Just, just go for the Horcruxes. And I feel like that's what happened. I feel like it's like Horcruxes are 
people. It's Cersei. It's mm-hmm. Daenerys. It's the the kingdoms. It's it's the seven kingdoms. It's who's in charge of the north. Who's in charge of this or that. And then those magical Deathly Hallows that could literally change the existence of the planet and could literally demolish you. Mm-hmm. Or if you had control of it, you would win. I don't know. The Deathly Hallows were the White Walkers. The Deathly Hallows was the Night King. Yeah. It was this magical element. And D&D had to say, shoot, man, we are we are movies eight and seven of, of Harry Potter. And we've got Horcruxes and Deathly Hallows. Shoot. What do we do now? It's a massive scope. It's a massive scope. And how do you how do you even handle that, right? And like D&D, have to find a way to have a fitting end for the Night King. Except... In Harry Potter, the Deathly Hallows were used at the very end to destroy the Horcrux. Okay? Yes. And in the end, Harry chooses to break the Elder One. Okay? See you later. All Horcrux is done, except for the um, invisibility. They, you're right. The, the first three episodes do feel very much like a, a separate show from yes. the final three episodes. Because you have the fear of the Deathly Hallows. You have this huge, magical fear of the White Walkers. And then the magic is gone. Yeah. I'm still negative. Shoot. I said I was going to be positive. (laughs) But I mean, the argument here would be, okay. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Am I like too distant? No, 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 no. You're you're, you're, you're right on track because you you have these two separate through lines of Game of Thrones that are both valid, right? And they both have been prevalent since episode one. Right. I mean, you're going to have to deal with Cersei. You're going to have to deal with the Night King. You're going to have to deal with Daenerys and who the hell is in charge and who's going to end up on the throne. What What is the world going to look like after all is said and done? You have to come to that point. And the argument I think that you could make would be you got rid of the Night King and it just happened. And that was the first three episodes. And then the next three episodes were Cersei and the Daenerys. Would the better show have been they lose Winterfell, they have to go back down to King's Landing because that's where they're retreating. Or the freaking veil, like I've told everybody. Or the veil. But you know what? Forget, <laughs> yes, the, forget sure. the veil. Let's just say it's King's <laughs> Landing. And they have this conflict with Cersei. And then it's Cersei and the Lannisters against the Night King, where the stakes are real. Yeah. Like, the stakes are, we've lost already. (laughs) If we lose here, it's the end of all we know. But we also have these personal stakes because we have our characters, Mm -hmm. we have their relationships, we know that uh, John and Danny are, are going to either be together or not, and the personal stakes of, does Danny blow up the city with all the walkers in it? Right. Uh, yep. So, do you settle? Do you settle all the family business in, in terms of the Godfather? Right. We're, we're, we're channeling the Godfather. No. Well, this is the problem: is that everyone, everyone who did not like this last season, has rewritten it in a way, shape, some way, shape, or form. Right. And that's why I don't like doing this because I'm not here to buy. I'm well, not here to write a better did. show. We just did for no, like no, forty it, minutes. No, no, we didn't. Where it's an argument. I was saying that I want to work within the confines of what the showrunners gave us. And within the within the same decisions, within the same final um, results, everything ends up the same. But how do we make it more meaningful? You in lose the Winterfell. You don't kill the Night King, and you lose Winterfell. The Night King and the White Walkers. No, no, no. no that's changing the fun, the fundamental Ugh. construct of the show. Crap. You can't you can't lose Winterfell. You have to win Winterfell. The Night King has to die in the third one. The Cersei has to die in the fifth one. How do you make it more meaningful? And I still maintain that everything would have been fixed. Everything would have been fixed if there was some either one inciting incident with Danny and why she changed and 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 blew up the city, or if there was no inciting incident, but we understood the stakes, not just on a macro level, but a micro level. For, da- for Daenerys. If we understood the stakes, it would have been more personal. If we had the I love you 3000 moment, mm-hmm. it would have been better. It would have made more sense because we would have seen what Danny was losing yep. by destroying the city. By destroying the city, it, in the way that it was shot, in the way that it was written, 
It just happens. And it happens for the sake of happening. What is the choice? What are we risking? And what happens if we, what are the consequences if we fail? Those are the stakes. And we don't get them. We just don't get them on a, on a micro level. And that's why we're all kind of confused saying, what was that all for? You know, we're all like Aaron Burr. <laughs> what do we, what will you fall for? This episode brought to you by Rise Up, a Hamilton podcast with Mary and Blake. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, overall, as I said, 4.7, one meaning it's poop, guys. Five meaning this just blew my mind. 4.7, I really loved this season. I really loved being with my favorite characters, being in Winterfell, being in King's Landing, riding on dragons, seeing the White Walker, seeing that epic battle with the Dothraki and the flaming swords. Oh, yeah, that was great. And then being like extinguished out. I love spending more time with Davos, seeing Melisandre like slip off and wither away and die. I loved that Arya killed the Night King. Yes, I did I too. loved so much of this season. That it is a four point seven. Right. In, in, in ending, ending on a positive note here, we're calling this episode of what we're doing here. We're calling it a dream of spring, which is the title of the final book of a song of ice and fire uh, that George R. R. Martin is writing. It will be the final title of the final book, uh, and I like it because the hope of what Danny was trying to bring is a dream the hope of what John is trying to live after now that he's created his own construct is a dream. It's not real. It's a dream. And I think that it's fitting with the end of Daenerys that it was the dream of Daenerys. It was the dream of Misa, the dream of a Targaryen Misa. coming back and, and ruling uh, justly and, and in the, the whole world being right again. And having that little callback moment of the of the plant in, uh, in above the north of the, the wall snow, and the yeah. snow and and it was spurting through and and maybe winter is over because the night king is dead. It's a dream of spring, and here, I, the dream of it all is that we began and we ended in the same place. But we, as an audience, and I think as the characters of the show. We have all changed. We've all grown. We've all become better for it. And that is the dream that we all should end up having at the end of this run, at the end of this show. I think we'll all look back two or three years from now and be a little less critical of it. I think we'll accept it as a whole yeah. a lot more easier than we are right now accepting it as a part. It's just one of the things that I had said to you was, you know... We've been doing a lot of rewatching of previous seasons and previous episodes. And yep. you say, oh my gosh, all of this, all of this, the Red Wedding, like everything led to this. And it was so fast and so abrupt and we got whiplash from it. But mm -hmm. also society got all in on this. As I said before, it was just us hardcore nerds watching and reading it before. I didn't read it, but Blake had read it, but we were all watching it before. Mm -hmm. And it was like this tight knit little thing. And then it became this juggernaut in society mm -hmm. and when society gets behind it society's rather negative i know i've been negative this episode guys please forgive me i'm not myself tonight <laughs> um but when society gets behind it of course people are even more critical you know we had t-shirts we had daenerys t-shirts we had targaryen we had everything and so because of that it became this monumental thing i mean people had game of thrones parties finale and premiere parties yeah. it became so huge that when it didn't live up to your expectations it was ginormous versus I mean, I, I've been honest. I generally don't like the first two slash three episodes of a season of Game of Thrones. I found it to be very slow pace. I'm rather bored. Mm -hmm. Had this been the way that this final season was, had it been stretched out, we might have been bored the first couple of episodes. And then what? People would have been like, oh, this season sucks, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't think they could have made the masses happy. I think that people would have always been critical. Um, everyone feels like they can write a better story, but I agree with you, Blake, that as we look back on this, we're really going to be amazed and in awe about this fictional, amazing story that took us to a world unlike our own with dragons and white walkers and family dynamics and plots and backstabbing and this in 
unbelievably strong family vet, like families that stick together through mm. thick and thin. The yep. Lannisters and the Starks stuck together. I mean, Tyrion didn't stick to Cersei, but you know what I mean. Yes. Like he still he still weeped at their death. He yes. still they were still siblings, and he was still trying to save her in the end. Right, right, right. So what? Right. I mean, it's perfect. I mean, there's just so much that you get to keep thinking about and unraveling. Um, and as a whole, I'm just so thankful that Game of Thrones was in my life. Yeah, I, I think saying that, you know, D&D are bad writers is unfair. They they gave us seven, if not eight, tremendous seasons of a, sh- of a massive, I mean, massive, gargantuan show. One that pleased us all so much. We loved it. So much Mm -hmm. that there are podcasts, there are (laughs) blogs, there are t-shirts. Yes. People loved it so much that they hated the finale. Or at least some people did. Because it had to end. Because it had to end and having your favorite thing end sucks. It's the worst. It's the worst, Burr. It really is. And that's the way that I choose to look at it. People loved it so much they felt so much that they were disappointed. Because if nobody cared, nobody would have talked about it. Agree. If it didn't matter, it wouldn't matter. And here we are. We're still talking about it three weeks later. This will be something that people will um, digest and analyze for years to come. The same way people are digesting and analyzing the ending to Lost, the same way that people are digesting and analyzing the end to Breaking Bad, or even in our case, the leftovers. People talk about this stuff. And people have always done this with books. When you get to that, you know, when you're holding a book, especially when it's like paperback yep. and you can really feel the thinness, and you're like, I have three pages left. I have two pages left. Mm -hmm. I have one page left and it's not a series or it's the end of the series. And you know, this is the end. This is your last time with these characters in this world from this author's perspective. And having it being new. And you don't want to put it down. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You don't want to read that last word. You do not want to close that cover because it makes you sad. Do do you remember reading the final words of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows? Yep. Do Do you remember how... You know, with the with the epilogue and everything, you were like, you just didn't want it to end. You, you I didn't want to read the final chapter. Agreed. Like I, I got to the point with Snape, and I was like, oh my god, you know, yes, like yes. just sobbing, reading a book, and there are tear marks. I remember reading the epilogue, being like, this is weird. This isn't what I expected. Like yeah. I, I didn't expect to go forward in time. And what is this? And you know, I mean, in hindsight now, exactly, I'm in a much better place. But none of us can ex- necessarily expect the ending for things that we love, for characters that we love, that we will be having an ending of. Because if we expected it, then we'd be complaining about that. That it was so, you know, we could, we could have figured it all out and called it. You know what I mean? Yep. So. And which is why I want to go back to the denouement of it all, which is. You love to say that word. I do. I love, the, I love saying it with that accent, a denouement. Uh, I want to go back to that what because. What does that even mean? It means the final. The final, the, the, the lasting image, the oh. final image. Oh, okay. The final image of the show. <laughs> and this is how I want you to grade. What the f- is the final image of the show? John, is it John? John walking okay. into, the, into the snow. That's what I was hoping it was. Um, I want you to grade your, I want you to look back at the finale with that in mind. What did they accomplish with that final image? What was that feeling that it gave you? That the that the people of the North are no longer afraid to be up North. That we started the entire series with the people of the North being afraid, acting out, being cut up. That that a uh, man of the watch literally abandoned it because he was so afraid from what he had seen. Right, and that winter was coming. And now you've. Uh, oh, sorry. Was this like a rhetorical question? No, no, no. You can you can answer it. it <laughs> I mean, it's it's rhetorical, but it's also applicable. Like, I I literally want you to pause the podcast and do what Mary just did. What is the final emotional response? What is the final emotional emotion that you that it that that image elicits? What is it trying to tell you? That you're no longer afraid. That you are something else you oh. can be 
No, 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 no. You know, this, this, for, for me, me, it's that it, they're no longer afraid. Right. That, that, and that's great. That's awesome. That is awesome. You don't have to be afraid because the construct is gone. And the same thing kind of goes for me. The ending means to me, you've created your own life. It's no longer the world of your parents. It's no longer the thing that was set up for you as we bring it back to what J.J. Abrams talked about for the, for the Rise of Skywalker. It's no longer the stuff of your parents. It's the stuff of you. You've made your world. And I think that's special. That is what I think encapsulates Game of Thrones. What is that to you? Grade your emotion and grade your, grade your liking of the finale off of that final image. Does that capture what Game of Thrones tried to give you? That's, yep. that's the final thing that I Good would have job. to say. Good job. Yes. Thank you. I'd say yes. You know what I don't picture? What's that? I don't picture John writing letters to Brienne. I don't see them really staying in touch. I know, neither do I. You know, I could see Arya doing it. Maybe Sansa. Yep. John, I think John goes off and is in a cave. And Oh no, I want him to have sex with wildlings. <laughs> like snuggle with ghosts, have babies, and like yeah. live happily ever after. Yes. Uh, anything else you want to say about this, my darling? Because we are already an hour and a half. I'm done, man. I think I'm done. I'm too. so done. I think I'm done. I'm so done with Bran. If you guys want, <laughs> if you guys want us to continue having the North Rim members episodes, we will do so. Please. What? Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, if because we might read the books, we might. Yeah. Well, I think we'll do a book club. I think we should do a book club once the new books come out in our spare time. In our, yeah. <laughs> um, but if you want us to continue having the episodes of the North Remembers, if there are topics uh, about which you would like us to talk, then we will. Please email us and let us know. As for now, my darling, would you like to close it out? Yeah, I'm feeling much better. I hope so. See, it's the roller coaster. You just gotta talk it out. It's gotta... just, it's just the brand beef. Yeah, the brand thing sucks. Like that's my beef. That it, that's a it's a, it's still it's a legitimate beef. I th- I honestly feel cool with everything else. Um, I would have liked it to be stretched out. I would have liked, but I'm saying like major plot points. I would have been cool with. Yeah, I think I'm cool with everything. I think I'm, I'm honest to God. I'm really cool with everything. If we had understood the stakes a little bit more, it would have been better. Yeah. But I'm still cool with it because I. Because I can, I can at least infer those things. Oh, That's God. part of my head canon. I just love Podrick. I'm glad that he at least he gets a good gig out of this pushing brain around. <laughs> He's a knight now, Sir Podrick, the pusher, the push, <laughs> Sir Podrick the pusher. All right, uh, you ready to close us out? I am. All right, let's do it. We want to thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it has. It's been three weeks since the finale, and you probably got this little notification in your podcast app saying, what? The North Remembers? Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you for listening, and thank you for being with us uh, on this entire journey of the final season of Game of Thrones. Yeah, as we talk about it, um, you know, it is a great honor and a great pleasure uh, of Mary and I's, I you know I can speak for Mary when I say this. It's a great honor to to have done this with you guys and to talk about it, to watch it, to laugh, uh, to make fun of it, and uh, but also to be quite serious about it and treat the thing that we love so much with the respect that I think it deserves, and being positive and uh, and enjoying the entire process. Uh, if you do want to continue listening to Mary and I, you can. Please go to maryandblake.com and check us out there where we have all of our podcasts, uh, including the newly minted podcast about Hamilton called Rise Up. That's I'm right. Rise very, up. Very, very excited about this podcast. I'm, I'm already, we're already planning it out. I'm looking for our next episode, our first episode to be published within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have a great plan. Uh, and a way to break it down. So I'm I'm pretty excited. We're, it's it's going to be more than just looking at it song by song. We're going to be we're going to be diving pretty deep uh, into what the story is, what the characters are, the benefits and the the problems of having the characters the way that they are, and even talking to certain historians, uh, Hamilton experts, if you will. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited about that. So find us also on social media, fa- on Facebook and Twitter. Just look up the word Marion Blake. 
The words. The words. The phrase. <laughs> the f- whatevs. You know, those things. All right, guys. We've already kept you here long enough. Go back and start up that. If you're, if you're missing Game of Thrones, I highly recommend doing a rewatch. As I said, Blake and I have been doing it all season long in the midst of watching these, the current If you're missing Game of Thrones, go watch The Leftovers. And then oh. listen to Mary and I. <laughs> yeah. For The Leftovers Actually, podcast. Yes. Yes. That's what I want you to do. Watch The Leftovers. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's and listen to our podcast. And listen it. to our podcast. <laughs> all right, guys. My name is Mary. My name is Blake. And the North remembers. <laughs>